The lobotomy, or the purposeful damaging of brain tissue, is remembered today as quack medicine. But like most quack medicine, back in its day it was considered cutting-edge technology, even winning a freaking Nobel Prize. Today, those pioneering doctors are remembered as butchers and murderers. Allow me to explain. Surprisingly, people have been drilling into each other's skulls since ancient times, and not just to eat the delicious contents. Very old skulls have been found with holes knocked in them, a procedure called tree panning, with signs of bone regrowth around the affected area, meaning that the patient survived the procedure. Treatment theories range from releasing intracranial pressure to releasing evil spirits. But intentionally cracking skulls and intentionally scrambling brains are two very different things. People didn't really begin doing the latter until the 1930s. At the time, mental institutions were very common and very overcrowded, and mental patients had very few treatments available to them. Mental disorders were very poorly understood, and effective drugs were decades away. And so, professionals the world over were trying all kinds of radical ideas. See, in 1927, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was given to Julius Wagner Jorek for his discovery that transfusions of blood from malaria patients to neurosyphilis patients could treat the syphilis by inducing high fevers. Bizarre, yes, and with a fatality rate of around 15%, but at the time, syphilis was considered terminal, and so it was a viable, if sketchy, treatment. At the same time, doctors were making slight progress in mapping the different brain areas, and began to wonder if brain surgery applied to the right areas would improve the behavior of those seen at the time as stark, raving mad. Opinions were split. Many thought the surgery ideas were unethical, and some deemed them too risky. But the ball was already rolling, and the bizarre experimentation had begun. A French doctor named Maurice Ducoste decided to tree pan holes in the sides of his patients' heads and inject malarial blood that way. Which is not at all what Wagner Joreg's procedure was supposed to look like, by the way. Then, a Portuguese doctor named Iga Moniz began experimenting with the injection of ethanol alcohol into the frontal lobes of the brain. He called this a leucotomy, an unnecessarily fancy name for an unnecessarily barbaric procedure. Why were they doing this? Well, see, the various injections killed off the surrounding brain tissue, and that's it. Moniz later voided all pretext by straight up cutting into the brains of his patients and removing seemingly random brain tissue. For this leucotomy, he won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1949. But despite the guise of the syringes, the sponges, and the anesthetic, what the procedure actually did to the brain was very poorly understood. Compared to today, all neurosurgeons had at the time were vague ideas of the properties of the prefrontal cortex, and guesses as to how the so-called brain wiring even worked or was laid out. Moniz spoke with hand-waving about bad brain circuits and how cutting them off from each other would help his patients. But things were about to get even worse. Enter Walter Freeman. An American doctor, he had a vision for a neurosurgical procedure that was cheap, fast, and could be taught in a single lesson. Thus, he invented the ice pick lobotomy. He performed the first one of these procedures by quite literally jamming an ice pick through the orbital bone of a patient and wiggling it around to destroy brain tissue. Over time, he perfected the procedure. He would first administer an electric shock until the patient was unconscious, and then he would drive a long metal skewer called an orbitoplast through the inner eye socket with a hammer. He would then perform a semi-calculated series of twists and wiggles to destroy brain tissue. He claimed the procedure took only minutes, and afterwards he could send the victim, I mean patient, home in a taxi cab. Walter Freeman crisscrossed the United States in his vehicle dubbed the Lobotomobile, personally performing three to 5,000 lobotomies and teaching the others that would usher in an era of roughly 45,000 more in the United States alone. Freeman claims that the procedure improved the lives of his patients, but the dark truth is that the procedure was designed in order to improve the lives of the patient's caretakers. During the heyday of Walter Freeman's lobotomobile era, there were over a million mental inpatients permanently residing in United States hospitals. Doctors were desperate and willing to try an ice pick or two in the hopes of curing their patients, or at least sending them home. Because even if the treatment didn't cure the patient, it did make them easier to care for. In the same way that removing an animal's legs makes them easier to care for. They stay in one spot while you feed and clean them. Even back then, some people realized this dark truth. MIT mathematician Norbert Wiener gave perhaps the best criticism. He stated that the use of the lobotomy was probably not unconnected with the fact that it makes the custodial care of many patients easier. Let me remark in passing that killing them makes their custodial care easier still. 
because what the lobotomy actually did was sever important connections, not bad connections. The damaged areas of the brain were different from patient to patient, and because many of them had variable problems to begin with, it's hard to know the extent of the damage sometimes. But here's a list of the possible side effects of your lobotomy. Lobotomies may cause incontinence, comas, comalex states, epilepsy, temporary and or permanent loss of language, memory and or muscle functions, internal bleeding, infection, blunting of personality and emotions, including the loss of fear and anxiety responses, weight gain, sexual promiscuity, loss of intelligence and capability of caring for oneself, surgically induced childhood, and deadness. And yes, sometimes patients' lives improved after receiving a lobotomy. By cutting out brain functionality, you can reduce stress in a person's life. After all, how can you be depressed or anxious if you can't remember or anticipate events? In juxtaposition, there are at least two cases of people attempting suicide by gunshot to the head, only to survive with damaged brains and realize they weren't depressed anymore. But it would be crazy to call that a treatment method, right? The lobotomy was a shotgun surgery, pulling the trigger and hoping for the best. Official estimates of Dr. Freeman's mortality rate range up to 15%, which means that around 700 people died from him jamming metal into their brains. On more than one occasion, he stopped mid-procedure to take photographs, and while fiddling with his camera, the orbital clasp slipped, killing the patient. Other atrocities committed by Freeman include operating on a child that was four years old, and going through with a procedure after a patient tried to back out by tricking him. You can read much more about Dr. Freeman in the memoir My Lobotomy by Howard Dully. Dully is now arguably the most famous person that Dr. Freeman lobotomized, when Dully was just 12 years old. Dully's stepmother hated him and sent him off for a lobotomy from Dr. Freeman, which made his life incredibly difficult. In a way, Dully was lucky to have the procedure so young, because as brain scans later helped to reveal, his brain had time to recover with the increased neuroplasticity of a child. You can either read the book or follow the link in the description to the related NPR piece, also called My Lobotomy. Dr. Freeman died mostly in disgrace, still firmly believing that he had invented a miracle cure. His procedure was mostly replaced by mood-altering drugs, which are safer and more easily reversible, sometimes called chemical lobotomies. Today, there is still an incredible amount of anger about what happened at the tip of that and many other ice picks. There are even movements to take away Iga Moniz's Nobel Prize. But many people have forgotten. It's just one more uncomfortable truth of history.